Hi folks, Astronomy Live here. Just a short video with a few quick updates tonight. Uh, if I sound a little bit funny or I cough a bit during this recording, I apologize. I'm running a bit of a cold right now and just going to try to power through it here because in a couple days we have the Great American Eclipse. And I want to talk about that briefly as well as uh, mention some things with my previous video, the CRS-12 launch and landing. And I want to thank everyone who viewed that video. Uh, it's currently over 7,000 views and still climbing, so it's uh, quite a popular launch video, and I think it's probably the best job I've done so far tracking the launch through landing of a Falcon 9 rocket. So please click on over to that previous video if you want to see it, if you haven't already. Uh, I did want to talk about some things because there are some quirks with this video, one of which is the fact that I use the official NASA audio for this launch, as I frequently do with my launch videos. However, I viewed the launch from Port Canaveral, which is south of the launch site, and some of the NASA tracking cameras were north of the launch site, and so at certain times in the video they'll say something like uh, the fact that they're currently showing Stage 2, when in fact all I'm tracking is Stage 1 after stage separation. Uh, they also talk about Stage 1 departing in a certain direction, and you'll see it uh, appearing to be in the opposite position in my video, and that's the reason why, because I'm viewing from a different perspective. Uh, Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. So if I go back here a little bit, we'll continue burning for showing the page two, continuing to okay, here we go. The nominal. We have Miko. So here's here's uh, stage separation coming up in the video, and we have Miko. Stage Main separation confirmed. You can see the stage separation. Stage one on the right, drifting back away from stage two. Continue. So right there, stage one is actually on the left in my video, whereas stage two is on the right, and that is what is continuing on into orbit. So that's because, again, my telescope was positioned south of the launch site, whereas the tracking cameras were on the opposite side. So I just wanted to point that out. Also, halfway into the video, uh, after the first run of the telescope footage, seconds. Landing legs deploy. Returns to Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, landing zone one. So there we go. There's the first uh, playthrough of the landing. LG and, I, the Falcon has landed. Land and I had to shut off the camera quickly at this point because I was actually getting a temperature alarm. It was so hot out that day, and we weren't getting any breeze at the river. It was perfectly still uh, that the camera actually started to overheat by the, the end of the recording. Landing operators move into procedure 11.100, section 3 on LZ-1 net. Meanwhile, Dragon spacecraft powered by the... So right here, I mentioned the fact that uh, the next playthrough of the video will have the GoPro footage, courtesy of Red's Rhetoric, as well as the uncut full video. So I just wanted to point out that the, the first run through of the video does have a single cut in it where I cut out a section of uh, the video where it was blocked by clouds for a significant length of time. And there really wasn't anything to see during that time. So I skipped over that part on the first run. But the second run, I left it completely alone and allowed it to play through completely uncut. And we've just heard the cue, the cue for that. So... Here is the section I cut out of the first run through the video, and as you can see, it's completely blocked by clouds. I'm moving the telescope up in the view on the left there, got it to the top of the cloud, and simply waited for the rocket to come back out of the top of the cloud. So there really wasn't much to see here for about 30 seconds, so I cut out this section uh, on the first run through, but I did leave it in place on the second run through. So I just wanted to point that out as well. All right, moving on to the total solar eclipse. So, we have a total solar eclipse that's going to pass from west to east across the United States on Monday, August 21st, just about two days from now. And some people have wondered why it will appear to move from west to east. And the reason for this is actually quite simple. The moon is moving in its orbit, and its orbital velocity is actually faster than the rotation of Earth. However, it has a lot farther to travel in its orbit than the Earth does in one rotation per day. The circumference of the Earth is, of course, much, much less 
than the total distance traveled by the moon in its orbit, which has an orbital radius of 384,400 kilometers. But it's that orbital velocity that really matters here, and that's why the shadow will be moving faster than the rotation of Earth. And so I've previously published this spreadsheet for calculating the apparent position of the moon and sun from a given location on Earth, but I've now modified it to give us more information about the circumstances of the eclipse. So you can put in your location and time, and it will tell you whether the eclipse is occurring, whether it's total. Uh, if the magnitude is over 1, that means it's a total solar eclipse. And it gives you that kind of information using um, information from a book that was published decades ago, as well as uh, Newcomb's equations for calculating, calculating the position of the sun. Now, taking that information, uh, what I did with the spreadsheet is expanded it by allowing it to calculate the position of the moon's shadow, or rather, where the moon's shadow is projected out into space from the perspective of the moon. So if you were at the center of the moon, looking out towards the moon's shadow, here are the right ascension and declination coordinates in degrees that the shadow would appear to be projecting out into space. Also calculated is the apparent position of the Earth from the center of the moon. So if you're looking at the Earth from the center of the moon, what are its right ascension and declination coordinates in degrees? And that is calculated here. And as you can see, those coordinates are very similar to the coordinates of the shadow. And that's because the moon's shadow is actually intersecting the Earth at this time, which is why we're having a total solar eclipse. So taking the displacement in degrees of the moon's shadow from the center of the Earth as seen from the moon, and taking into account the angular size of the moon, or sorry, the angular size of the Earth as seen from the moon, uh, I was able to calculate the approximate coordinates of the shadow on the Earth's surface. Now, this isn't taking into account uh, the oblate shape of the Earth. This is assuming Earth is perfectly spherical, so these coordinates aren't super precise, but it's good enough for our purposes. And so this gives us uh, longitude and latitude of that shadow point on the Earth's surface. And if we calculate that over multiple points in time, we can actually... Uh, plot out what the uh, path of totality will look like across the United States. So, let's see here, going to 1700 universal time, you see the approximate coordinates here. We can see the moon's lat longitude and latitude above the Earth. And I should point out, negative in this case uh, refers to uh, western longitude. And then we can step forward here half an hour, and then another half an hour. And what you see is that the longitude and latitude of the shadow are, is moving towards the east, even as the moon's longitude and latitude, latitude is moving to the west as expected, because the moon has a lot farther to travel in its orbit around the Earth than the Earth does in one rotation per day. But if we take these coordinates of the shadow's center point on the Earth and plot that into Google Earth, we come up with this chart. And as you can see, it's expected to move from west to east uh, from sometime after 1700 universal time to sometime a little before 1900 universal time is when it will cross out of the east coast. And you can see this matches up pretty well with the official plots of the trajectory of the moon's shadow on the Earth's surface, as expected. And one last thing I wanted to point out is that, indeed, my prediction is not the only non-NASA prediction to show that the eclipse path should be from west to east. In fact, you can look back at predictions that were made over a hundred years ago and find that to be true. Here is a map of the eclipse published in 1887, and here the open triangle denotes the beginning of the eclipse, and down here the closed triangle denotes the end of the eclipse. And as you can see, it is predicted to pass from west to east on August 21st, 2017. So that is to be expected, and that is what you will see in predictions that were made long before even NASA came into existence. So I hope that clears up 
that issue. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments, and I'll try to get to them before Monday. I will be photographing the eclipse, if the weather allows, and I'm going to do everything I can to get to a location with good weather, but we'll just have to see. Um, I won't be able to webcast the eclipse live. I'm not anticipating that. Uh, it's very likely that the cell phone networks are going to be jammed up all along the path of totality. So I'm not anticipating, anticipating being able to webcast the Eclipse live, unfortunately. But I will bring back whatever photos and videos I'm able to collect and share it here with you uh, after the fact. Uh, please do be safe during the Eclipse. Don't look directly at the sun during the partial phases of the Eclipse. You have to wait until totality to take off uh, your safe solar filters to look at the sun directly because you need the sun to be completely blocked the surface brightness of the sun is damaging to your eyes even if only a little bit is peeking out so please do keep that in mind and be safe on monday thanks for watching clear skies folks